During my college years, I worked in the summers on an island called Catalina, about 25 miles off of Los Angeles. My job was lifeguard and boat keeper in a place called Emerald Bay. While I was on this job, I met a young Christian man who was probably one of the most unusual personalities I've ever met. He came from a very strong Christian home, and he had a real great Scots background. And he loved to get into any kind of an argument or tussle or anything we could think of whereby we could compete. Like who could memorize a hundred verses of scripture a day and we'd keep firing back and forth till one gave up. I remember one time we were out in a war canoe that ten people are supposed to paddle, but we decided we could handle it all by ourselves. We were about four miles off the uh, island of Catalina. And we got hit by a little storm. wasn't anything unusual. I guess the waves weren't more than five or six or seven or eight feet high. But two people in a war canoe, it's pretty rough. And I was in the bow, and he was in the stern. And I was just working to keep that bow into the waves so we wouldn't get swamped and capsized, because it's a long swim at four miles. And all of a sudden, over this storm, the wind's blowing and you get hit with all the spray and you're soaked and everything, and it looks bad. I heard all these Scots songs being sung. And so I just stopped long enough and trailed my paddle to look back to see what Freddie was doing. He's just having a ball. <laughs> and I suddenly realized I was doing all the work, and he wasn't even paddling. He was singing Scott songs. He was up like this, and he'd stuck his paddle in the water as a rudder. <laughs> and it's been that way ever since. This afternoon, it was 26 years when he was shot down over Berlin. Now, he was on his 50th and last mission. You know, they used to rotate 25 missions. And then you can volunteer for 25 more. Two days before his last mission, he wrote and told me about how he was looking forward to coming home, how he was looking forward to studying for the ministry, all the things that were happening. He had won every member of his air crew to the Lord but the navigator. He wanted me to pray for the navigator. By the way, the navigator accepted Christ in prison camp. And that was the last letter I ever had from him. And then uh, we got information that he was missing. And then finally got word through the German Red Cross that he had died in the manner in which he died. His plane was hit by flak. His engines caught fire. And he was in a hopeless situation. And someone had to hold the plane in control long enough for everyone to get out. Now, it doesn't take more than 15 seconds, but someone has to keep the plane going in the right direction for those 15 seconds, or a centrifugal force will keep everyone inside. They'd all have been killed. So Fred gave his life so that his crew could get out. For that 15 seconds, he kept the plane on a more or less even keel, and everyone bailed out except Fred. And just as the last one got out, who was the co-pilot, of course, the plane blew up, and Fred went to be with the Lord. Now, it's a very interesting that tonight we're going to have a special. And this special comes at a very interesting time, because Fred McIntosh had his right woman. They had a wonderful life together. I was out in Los Angeles preaching, or teaching, or whatever I do. And I saw a very familiar person in the audience, and I recognized right away it was Fred's widow. And I just looked down and smiled. I mean, I'd gotten up and said about two words, and she just jumped up, just crying, went out. And 
She apologized afterwards. She said, I can't ever see you again. I can't ever even talk to you again. It always reminds me so much of Fred. And uh, she can't till this day even listen to tapes. Still reminds her of the one that she loves so much. Tonight we're going to have a special, an addendum, on the doctrine of right man, right woman.